Welcome, everyone. In this presentation, we open another chapter in the Freddy Künstler saga, Peering with an Incumbent. Freddy was born in the 1960s. He worked in the IT before he started uh, in its seven with FFF money. His first interlink link he has ordered in 1998, it was a 128-kbit link, which was really fast at this time. Um, he was president of the Swiss X and uh, is also um, a politician. He moved up into the larger municipal, municipal council in winter two in 2008. So it's a very well 12 year experience in politics. Um, in 2014, fiber gigabit for private customers in Switzerland was offered by his company. And he is married since 23 years and has 11 year old son, always fighting for less gaming time. So before we start, um, some more information. There will be a short one-on-one -on -one questionnaire session at, after this presentation. If you have any questions, please write them into the chat and start them with a big Q so that I can find them easily. Please welcome Freddy, the stage is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Could everybody hear me? Good afternoon, uh, community. Buenas tardes, bonjour à tous. Grüezi miteinander. I'm my, unfortunately, my English is a bit rusty as we haven't had many of the conferences recently. And uh, so I could uh, offer you either this rusty English or Swiss German. Um, <clears throat> peering with the incumbent is the topic today. And uh, first I have to lose a few words about uh, Init7. Init7, 20 years old now, and uh, we are one of the remaining independent ISPs in Switzerland in winter tour. 50% revenue 2013 was done with IP wholesale. So we have this backbone AS13030 massive peering outbound heavy traffic ratio. I come to that later why it's important. About 40% revenue with business customers then and only a few percent uh, residential costs are mainly DSL services uh, with BBCS. Uh, BBCS is the equivalent in Switzerland for layer three BSA in Germany. 2014, we redefined the broadband market in Switzerland. We launched Fiber 7. This is a symmetric gigabit internet FTTH for a disruptive price for 777 Swiss francs per year. This is uh, 64 uh, francs per month, so roughly 60 euro. Fiber 7 is not broken. This is our aim, no CGN, uh, IPv6, multicast TV, choice of router, speed and peering. Today, com the company changed completely. We do about 80% revenue with residential customers 10% revenue with business customers and the remaining 10% with wholesale IP. The traffic experienced a metamorphosis from outbound heavy to inbound heavy in the past years. This matters later. Uh, usually on these conferences, I'm allowed to do one marketing slide. So here we go. Um, we are the winner of 2018, 19 and 20. Uh, the Belongs Telecom rating. This is a uh, a monthly magazine about the economy in Switzerland. Uh, we got the medal for uh, best internet provider for residential customers. So that's done now. Uh, we come to the topic peering with the incumbent. Peering with the incumbent? No. Thank you. That was my talk. Uh, good. No, no. Um, seriously, incumbent peering. Incumbent peering. If you look at the incumbent in Switzerland, the telecom liberalization uh, was done in January 1998, so a bit more than 20 years now. The former PTT Post Telephone Telegraph becomes Swisscom main shareholder with 51% is the Swiss Confederation, so the uh, Switzerland, the country. They're on the stock market and um, they have some 56% share in broadband market and some 50 plus percent share in mobile. So they're large, at least for Switzerland, they're large. Um, Swisscom operates uh, AS3303, and this AS contains their residential customer base and also their mobile customers. 
they peer with most large eyeball networks and they have a single IP transit carrier or at least as one relevant uh, transit carrier. This is Deutsche Telekom 3320. <clears throat> Their peering policy, if you look back on the version they had around 2008 to 2012, you would call it a selective peering policy. Uh, they have some requirements, uh, geographic size of the network, which must be at least half the size of Swisscom themselves. And uh, you have to uh, aggregate uh, a slash 11 IPv4 addresses, and of course, some, some usual stuff like uh, uh, an amount of traffic you have to have and, and uh, um, the 24-7 uh, uh, call, et cetera, et cetera. So the link below shows their um, uh, peering policy, which is slightly updated, but uh, still is more or less the same from 2012. Then they uh, require also a balanced or um, a balanced traffic ratio, which uh, should not exceed two to one in, in, in either way. And um, this, of course, discriminates content-heavy networks and reverses the uh, causation principle, but this is nothing new. They also differentiate between national and the international peers, which is clearly illegal by Swiss and European law. This might have changed since. So I'm going to um, tell you a bit about the long way to peer Swisscom. I can't um, exactly to tell the story anymore. My first attempts to peer Swisscom started probably around 2002 or 2003. This is ages ago and uh, my notes then, uh, they were definitely gone, but um, it was a long journey and I tried a lot of the methods described in the uh, white paper of Bill Norton, The Art of Peering. Um, I suppose many of you, you have read this paper, it's still valid, even though it's uh, ages old, it's uh, probably in stone age of, of internet, but it's still valid. Around 2007, according to my email history, I started to involve lawyers uh, for the first time because Swisscom didn't want to peer us. So, oops, that was one click too much. Here we go. <clears throat> um, so we, we grown our network, we aggregated the required slash 11 over time. And uh, um, so we fulfilled at least this um, requirement. We also expanded our backbone. So we uh, came to the half of the size of Swisscom in number of uh, peering points. And last but not least, we were required to peer in Zurich and Geneva. Uh, despite our French is, um, well, at least my French, our CTO's French is perfect, but my French is a bit poor. Um, we expanded to Geneva and uh, we uh, installed a router in CERN to peer there with Swisscom. Uh, after all, 2011, we achieved the goal to peer them uh, on a zero settlement basis and uh, as a matter of fact, they called it initially a uh, test peering. So we got the two 10 gig DNI links uh, in Zurich and in Geneva. Um, this was important because at the time we were transiting a lot of uh, SA2 IPTV traffic, which made the traffic ratio beyond two to one, but it was nevertheless accepted. If we look at the broadband monopoly of, of an ISP, um, this is important because the ISP can monopolize the customer. This is due the technical fact of the network structure. This um, applies to any ISP. They are monopolizing their customers unless the customer is multi-honed. So if we look at the Swisscom broadband customers, um, they are, we're in the AS, which is now here in this uh, image, which I, I borrowed from level three or the company called Lumen today, I guess. Um, so the, the AS of Swisscom is here or of, of any broadband provider is, is this uh, blue cloud in the middle. And there is no other way to 
reach the end customer of this provider, except through these interconnection points, which are yellow marked. And uh, I will use this slide again later on because that shows the problem. 2012, they sent a request to visit us and they came with a gun, pay or die. In, in summer 2012, Swisscom announced us that they're going to cancel the newly achieved peering contract uh, less than a year later. The new contract they proposed to be signed by NIT7, we have to pay three Swiss francs per megabit for any traffic which is exceeding the ratio of two to one. And these three francs was a price beyond transit then. We did not sign. Um, we replied them when they asked, are you going to sign or can we expect the contract? You are going to hear from us in a suitable way. So we sued them. This was the suitable way, it seemed to me then. And we sued them uh, for competition, for abuse of competition. We went to the Handelsgericht Bern because Bern is the, um, the, the head office of, of, of Swisscom, so we have had to sue them there. And after a few months, they decided we are not in charge. Peering is a question of regulation. We lost the case wrong way. At least while the case was ongoing, the peering remained up despite they canceled the service uh, or the peerings and uh, we could gain some time. We also tried to negotiate the three francs or uh, telling them that this is a ridiculous price and uh, um, but we, we, couldn't, we couldn't achieve something, of course. So when we lost in Bern at the Handelsgericht, um, they started to rate limit the peering. They, did they didn't do unplug, they just rate limited to two times one gig, but they didn't tell us about this. And this caused a lot of trouble because we were completely unprepared to route the traffic in a different way. It took us a while until it got detected and uh, it, it was not how you should do a deep hearing. The reason for doing that, they wanted to force Satu, which was a, our big customer for TV streaming, uh, plus also another TV streaming customer we had at the time. They, they wanted to force them to sign peering contracts, paid peering contracts for a much higher rate than they paid uh, with, uh, they paid for, um, uh, us. And uh, I think today they're still locked into this contract. So we had to go find another way and we sued them again, round two. Um, of course, we took the decision of the Handelsgericht Bern uh, to, to the Bundesgericht, and uh, so this is the highest court in Switzerland, but we lost again, at least um, the deep hearing uh, was what they showed us how, which way we should go, uh, ask the regulator to get it fixed. So I call this the competition case, um, and the other case, the second round, I'm going to call that the regulation case. So we started round two, the regulating, uh, regulator, regulating case, and we had to go to the regulator. This is in Switzerland, the Federal Communications Commission or ComCom. And uh, we asked again for a precautionary measure that Swisscom must keep the peerings alive. This case, the regulatory case is divided into two parts, is the precautionary uh, part and the main part. In German, this is called Zugangsverfahren. While Kong Kong was not really amused about the case because, I mean, the general meaning, uh, the general understanding of peering is the market should regulate the peering. They nevertheless uh, granted the precautionary measure. So Swisscom had to 
re-establish the full 10 gig, full two times 10 gig capacity. And at least network operation was, was safe at the time. Um, our customers, especially the, 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 the IP TV streaming customers, so two and the other one, uh, they, they were gone meanwhile. So we lost those customer uh, despite that we had the capacity re-established. When we had this precautionary measure uh, granted, Swisscom appealed against that decision at Bundesverwaltungsgericht. This is the uh, next instance, and um, they lost there uh, because it was also the last instance. They couldn't go and take it to the Bundesgericht, which is usually the, 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 the last one. Meanwhile, they started Comcom and Barcom, and Barcom does some administrative uh, um, uh, tasks for Comcom. Barcom is the Bundesamt für Kommunikation in, uh, in English, the Ofcom. They started to work on that case. And first thing they did was um, they asked the WECO, which is the Competition Commission, to investigate uh, market dominance and uh, abuse of, of, of market power. Uh, WECO then did a questionnaire. And some might still remember that because they, they sent this questionnaire out to some hundred plus peering participants. Anyone in um, Europe who had an IP backbone or, or a large uh, content, um, they got this questionnaire. The cartel. The investigation of WECO figured that Swisscom and Deutsche Telekom did some abusive behavior, uh, abusive things, and they built a cartel. The point is to enforce this two to one ratio of Swisscom spearing policy. And, and, and uh, this was not only imposed to us. Swisscom used their DTAC transit as a leverage. What also happened, DTAC paid kickback to Swisscom because they could harvest paid peering or transit traffic on behalf of Swisscom and hand it over to Swisscom. And many of the content networks paid that service. And for that, DTAC paid kickback to Swisscom. And this is actually not a secret because it has been freely admitted by Falk von Bornstedt. I hope he's also in the, in the, in the conference today. He's the former peering manager of uh, Deutsche Telekom. And he admitted that to me at the Global Peering Forum 10 in uh, Bahamas, which was uh, actually quite a pleasant uh, experience, but not the fact that this, uh, uh, that he admitted the, the fact that DTAC paid Swisscom kickback. So to understand the cartel, we need to look at DTAC's position in the global IP market. Uh, as most of you know, DTAC is a so-called tier one network with 100% peering. And uh, it's also common knowledge that most of these peerings with uh, other, uh, or at least some of these peerings uh, with other tier one networks, they are massively overbooked. If you're on a IPTV streaming business, and I come to the earlier slide before with the uh, scheme of, of, the, uh, of the content flowing traffic to the end customer. If you are one of these IPTV streaming businesses and you want to reach the customers uh, in DTAC network, there is no other way than paying DTAC because the, the first three interconnection points they are massively overloaded, so you couldn't get a reasonable, a reasonable quality arriving at your customer, the, which is a broadband customer of, of, of the tag or of the provider. So there was no choice than paying a lot. To summarize this, DTAC was and still is able to enforce every content network to pay. I know this is a common behavior these 
days in the industry, other large ISPs around the globe do the same, Telefonica, for example, or Comcast, just to name a few. But I believe this behavior is genuinely wrong. <clears throat> so here's how the cartel worked. Swisscom used DTAC as a leverage to enforce their policy. At the same time, DTAC could blackmail more money from content. I combined these two uh, schemes of the position of the two networks. And uh, thanks uh, to Her Hurricane Electric for providing those um, on bgp.he.net. Um, at the time of the cartel, Swisscom was peering with much less networks, especially they weren't peering with level three or cogent or others, which were selling um, reasonable priced IP transit capacity. So there was no choice to reach Swisscom end customers, except either paying Swisscom, buying uh, paid peering, or you get transit from Deutsche Telekom and in either way, in either way, Swisscom gained the money because they DTAC paid them the kickback. While WECO, the Wettbewerbskommission, the Competition Commission uh, was investigating um, this fact, this cartel, they, um, they, they figured the abusive behavior and it was caused by us that they were looking into this issue. The point is that anti, antitrust law in Switzerland is rather weak. If a cartel gets detected, the vehicle requests the cartel members to sit on a round table. Um, it works about like this. Vehicle says, hey, Swisscom and DTAC, you have a cartel problem, get it fixed. Swisscom and DTAC, okay, here is our new contract. The terms and conditions you didn't like have been adjusted. Are you happy now, Veiko? And Veiko says, sure, thanks, no problem. Don't do it again, will you? Thanks for corporate, your cooperation. There are no fines, no punishment, no nothing. Um, this is called, um, um, it, it's called Vorsorgliche Untersuchung. It, it doesn't have it, it, it's still not a legal case. It's just they investigate and they give the chance to get it fixed. Uh, this is um, the antitrust law in, in Switzerland. I suppose in the United States, if you do the same, you will drop in jail. The cartel officially ended in January 2016. DTAC had to stop paying kickback. Um, they made some contract, which I don't exactly know how they fixed it, but I suppose money-wise, it's still about the same. They probably just lowered the IP transit fees for Swisscom or whatever. Because the behavior didn't change though. Uh, for our case, the point was while Waco was dealing with Swisscom and DTAC, our, our case, our regulatory case was just suspended for, I don't, I don't remember exactly, maybe al almost two years. Uh, what we could ob observe is that Swisscom started to gradually set up new peerings with larger networks, such as uh, a or level three. And the fact or the, the abusive behavior remained unchanged. If you look at this hashtag Netflixgate on Twitter, you would find a lot of things of 2016 because spring 2016, uh, Swisscom sees themselves in a shitstorm, uh, which was later then called Netflix Gate. What happened? Netflix decided to stream their content uh, not no longer towards us, the content to sw towards Swisscom end customers, no longer via their expensive links at T D tag. Instead, Netflix choose. Uh, coachant to uh, as their exit to Swisscom and guess what happened? The traffic was stuck in overloaded peerings between coachant and, and uh, DTAC. 
So Swiss command customers couldn't watch Netflix anymore in a reasonable quality or uh, almost they didn't get anything. About five days later, peering started between Swisscom and Netflix uh, because of this shitstorm. Of course, Netflix is, was not and is not paying any money for those peerings, uh, and even, even though they probably have a 20 to one rate traffic ratio. And the good thing was general media was reporting widely about um, this uh, schlamassel as, as Watson was uh, titling. Um, the fun fact is the shitstorm started by a tweet of Victor Jacobo, who is one of the most famous Swiss comedians. Our case went on. Veco was reporting to Comcom. The Competition Commission, which is also kind of Comcom, but in, in Germany it's a Wettbewerbskommission, uh, they sent a report to Comcom and in summary, they came to the following statements. Swisscom is market dominant, which is important to, um, to be along the, the telecommunications law and IP transit is not a substitute for peering as Swisscom was always saying. They've been abusing their uh, position during the time of the cartel together with DTAC. Comcom had to come to a decision and it took them quite a while, almost two years until they said, we are going to reject the claim. Even though, Com uh, even, even though VECO, the Wettbewerbskommission was very clear, they rejected our claim. And they also stopped the obligation for Swisscom to keep the peering alive. Last but not least, we should take all the cost of uh, total 126,000 uh, Swiss francs to cover the, the, the whole process. And uh, yes, I, I, uh, I got a lot laughter cramp when I uh, uh, actually got this decision. Immediately after the decision of Comcom, Swisscom sent us an invoice for the traffic beyond the two to one traffic ratio total 550,000 uh, Swiss francs, we should have been paying between, I think approximately 2013 or 2000, mid of 2012 to 2018. One good thing, Swisscom at least agreed to keep the peering alive. Um, despite that, their obligation has actually ended. During that years, um, uh, as I said before, in its seventh network, changed completely from outbound heavy to uh, eyeball. So to not, well, inbound heavy, yes. And uh, we were at the, uh, um, at the traffic ratio of uh, two to one, which was within the requirements of Swisscom. And today, actually 2020, we are uh, one to one. Actually, we pull even a bit more from Swisscom than uh, they pull from us. Why did Comcom this decision? Why they, uh, rejected their day our claim? I don't know. I suppose the decision was motivated by the simple fear to be the first regulator in Europe to be forced to regulate IP peering. BEREC, body of European regulators for electronic communications. This is basically the the DNOC of, of all the European uh, regulators. They, they of course uh, observe our case and the, the, uh, yeah, the, the common knowledge is the market should regulate the peering. Um, of course, I have no proof for that. This is an assumption. Uh, maybe Beric will one day make a statement. So we appealed again. We took the case to again to the Bundesverwaltungsgericht, which is the next and the last instance. And uh, the positive thing was that we got the same judge who already decided in the precautionary case um, that helped a lot. So they uh, already knew what peering is and what it means. 
And uh, besides, we of course had to uh, ensure that the uh, 550,000 Swiss francs uh, don't does, uh, don't get processed by debt collection office. Um, so yeah, but this was a minor issue. On April 22, 2020, this was our lucky day because the Bundesverwaltungsgericht, the BVGR, they uh, this judge overruled the decision of Comcom completely and they accepted our claim. And as I said, they are the last instance, so they, it could not be appealed again. Of course, the 120,000 Swiss francs, they're off the table, but that's not the most important thing. If you, if you read the, the decision, the statements of the judge, the ISP has a technical monopoly over its customers. IP transit is not a substitute for peering. Traffic ratio must not be a price criteria for peering and Swisscom is dominating the market. This is remarkable because most of these things, they are clear for years and years uh, within our community, but there was no judge confirming um, these clear statements. And I'm very happy about that uh, because it has an impact. It, has, it will have an impact. So where is the case going? They it sent back to Comcom and they are forced now to set the price for peering according to the Swiss telecommunications law and um, uh, the considerations taken by the judge. Uh, we did a press release. You might want to click that later on. It's in German uh, where we um, comment the, the decision of, of the Bundesverwaltungsgericht. So what is the true cost of peering? The true cost of peering, in, according to the Swiss telecommunications law, um, the, the price has to be calculated using the LRIC methods, the long run incremental cost method. This method is uh, very common to uh, value the infrastructure of the incumbent. Uh, in, in, in any European country, I believe. So Comcom asked Swisscom to present their LRIC calculation. Uh, maybe they try to hope to find a way to justify the, the claimed three Swiss francs per megabit traffic uh, beyond the ratio they requested, uh, even though that the Bundesverwaltungsgericht uh, said the price is not the criteria to set the uh, the, the ratio is not the, uh, a criteria to set the price of peering. I don't know. Swisscom presented their Elric calculation, some 20 pages, blacking out a lot of relevant information because these are the business secrets. I'm not an Elric expert. My lawyer is not an Elric expert, so we needed some help. And we got it from the people at the WIC Consult Wissenschaftliches Institut für Infrastruktur und Kommunikationsdienste. They're around for ages. Um, you can guess that when they got the um, URL uh, wik.org. So they must be around for ages and they're well known in the regulators community. Um, so we asked them to write an expertise and uh, to comment on Swisscom's calculation and their findings, it's all wrong. Because Swisscom is including a huge amount of costs which are not costly for peering. WIC states that um, the only causal cost of peering according to the calculation, um, they are rather small. Only the direct interconnection costs can be considered. Means the two interfaces of the routers, maybe 10 or 100 gigabit, doesn't matter. And the cable in between those two interfaces, nothing else can be considered. Both peering partners bear their own approximately similar cost for their routers. 
so the equipment cost cannot be considered either. That remains the cost of the, uh, the cable, the X connect. Common practices that when you have, when you peer with someone on, on, with PNIs, um, the, you, you, you order the, X, the cross connects alternately. So the first one is paid by this party and the second one with, with that. Because usually you have more than one peering with a, with a, a peering partner um, to make it redundant and, to, and geographically diverse. Considering this, Wick concludes that the cost of peering is zero. Where are we going? The saga continues because ComCom has to come to a decision and has to regulate the IP peering. This is what they wanted to avoid. And with Wick's clear opinion, we expect ComCom to set the price to zero. I expect the decision by 2021. And of course, if they uh, uh, come to some absurd price, uh, we will take them, we will take the decision again to the uh, Bundesverwaltungsgericht, um, which decided already twice in our favor. Um, I believe that this whole process of seven years, it started in uh, summer 2000, uh, no, actually it's all eight years, meanwhile, uh, it's, uh, when it started in 2012, on the long term, this case will have an impact on, on the peering behavior of uh, incumbents and other large networks, and this on a global or at least European uh, um, uh, focus. So this is my talk. Here you have my contact details. And uh, if you have legal questions, this is a uh, Simon Schlauri, who is our attorney for a couple of years now, uh, he's, uh, he, he's, he's got his professor habilitation, I think, uh, um, with the topic net neutrality. So he, is, uh, he has really clue about all that stuff. And uh, happy peering. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Freddy. Um, that was really an enlightening talk, and uh, I really enjoyed um, hearing the saga. This is uh, really a long time now, um, and I think we have not seen the last pages of the saga, and that it will continue. So let me start with a very simple question on slide um, pay or die. You mentioned that the IP transit price in 2012 was um, three Schweizer Franken. And um, do you remember what other carriers in Switzerland uh, has, um, um, uh, what, what do you have to pay if, if you would go, have gone to another carrier there? What was the official uh, no, price? No, no, the, the price was way below the three Swiss francs. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, but that was, that was at the time, that was uh, some two euro 50 mm -hmm. with the, the, the exchange rate then. And, uh, and the transit price was already below one, one euro. So it was, it was a lot cheaper to buy transit. But the point is, and this was um, judged by the Bundesverwaltungsgericht, transit is not a substitute for peering. So there mm -hmm. wasn't an option to just get transit and go home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that, there was a question about the BVG from the audience, um, I will uh, read it. Why did the BVJ decide in your favor? What was the explanation? Why they didn't or why they did? Why they did? The, the Bundesverwaltungsgericht or yes. the, Bundesgericht, the Bundesverwaltungsgericht. Yeah, because, uh, because they, uh, the, the, there was the cartel and they abused the position, the market position. And, and a lot of other considerations, uh, as we could prove that the, the interconnects um, of, of, of the transit of Swisscom were overloaded. There wasn't uh, a, enough, good enough quality um, to, to be able to operate IPTV. 
And then there are some other considerations like uh, longer AS paths, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Higher latency, packet loss, et cetera, et cetera. There were a lot of considerations, so it's not, not a straightforward answer I can give that uh, uh, I can give. But I mean, um, if, you, if you can read German, uh, these documents, they're all public. And if you want to read uh, 100 pages or more, um, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Does the court um, has specialists um, which uh, supported them in all the technical stuff, which I think is something very simple for us, for this community, but I think for court, for lawyers, this is a total new area. Uh, I think they got the expertise, yes. So they, or they learned it, they learned a lot. They had to read all the papers and uh, figure out how it works. So we, I mean, at least Comcom, these are people which, uh, which, which have a technical background or a telecommunications background. Um, of course, it's, it's not as deep as most of us in, in, in our community, but uh, I, I'd say they, they acquired the, the expertise uh, over time. Okay, so let's come to the next question. I think that uh, um, there was a question, were you ever afraid um, or feared that you could lose all your money on this? No, no. Uh, and if it would have happened, so be it. Uh, I think I could have found find another job in the community and in the in industry to, to uh, make my family survive, but uh, no, never. I mean, it's certainly an amount if, if you're confronted with, uh, with a half a million, all of a sudden extra costs, which are not in budget. But uh, I mean, given that we are not a large company, but uh, I mean, you can find uh, over time payment plans, etc., etc. So it wouldn't have killed us. That's but, a little bit I mean, of fear it's, it's, there was it's more always. Like a, ma a matter of justice. I mean, mm. a matter of justice. If I would lose, I wouldn't care about the money. If I would lose, then I genuinely know the decision is wrong mm -hmm. because they abused and are still abusing their market position and their technical monopoly. Okay, thank you. Another question about Concom. Um, what is the general attitude of CONCOM towards Swisscom? Are they stuffed by old Swisscom bodies or is there real independence? Um, you know, CONCOM, there are seven people and uh, most of them are either have a political background, financial directors of Canton, whatever, or they are professors, etc., etc. And a couple of years ago, uh, there was an art article in Sunday Press that uh, uh, three of the seven members are um, uh, sponsored by Swisscom because they are professors and their institutes, they get money, etc. Befangen in German, I don't know the exact word in, in, uh, in, in, in English. So they were befangen. Okay. Uh, I think this has changed because, I mean, the seven people, they, they get replaced. Um, the, for example, one of the current members of Comcom Com is the former CEO of Cisco Switzerland. So at least part, uh, uh, some of them have ideas how the telecommunication industry works. So I think they, get, they have better people now than, than maybe four or five years ago. But uh, yeah. Who knows? <laughs> the, if if you want to if you want to uh, uh, make your own consideration, just Google Comcom member Switzerland, and you should be uh, okay, and have an idea who is who is whom. And uh, yeah, we don't know. I will have a look. It uh, sounds interesting to see this. Okay, um, another question, a little bit more controversial. Um, why is everyone allowed to earn money with their network or their services, except Swisscom or DTEC? And it's seven also sales IP transit. Why? Uh, 
this is this is not an adequate question because they're they're even if they have the same way allowed to make the money like everybody everybody in the industry can make the money operating their network the question is are they allowed to abuse their market position and are they allowed to abuse their technical monopoly which they apparently did this is the question so it's a lot about the price um at the end um well if we if we look at the, who is causing the traffic then it's the, and this is also written in the in the wick paper um the traffic is caused by the end users no doubt about that and so actually if the end users pay money to swisscom swisscom should actually pay money to uh, uh, to the content to get the traffic but uh, um, so i mean they they just reverse the verursacher prinzip in german i don't know the, the causation principle mm -hmm. so they, this is reversed um, the I mean, we don't ask for money to when we when we push content to Swisscom, we we just want want to be treated fair. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, interesting point is if you if you look at uh, uh, Liberty Global's peering policy, this is a very weird peering policy, but because they they just follow the same the same like Swisscom, it's the same principle, but they have an exception. If you are a very large content network, you get free peering. Um, if you dump the traffic uh, in regions, in countries, you get free peering. So they get they made the policy to justify uh, the, the peering with the, the Netflixes and the, the Googles. And yeah, I mean it's 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 rather transparent what what they what they actually do but uh, i mean this is this is not fair i mean they they treat bigger other than the smaller uh, the small ones and uh, it's 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 a question of fairness okay so one last question from my side um do you think that appearing and uh, should be regulated by governments or parliament or european union Um, well, market abuse is regulated. And this whole process of fighting for, for a fair uh, and, and discriminate-free peering was caused by them because, because they wanted to charge me an abusive price. So you say so, that actually the tools are there, we should use them? Of course. Of course, uh, and um, um, I hope that that this uh, decision of, of in Switzerland will have an impact on other countries which face the same the same problem. Because okay. I mean that the regulators should look into this, and if uh, if a market participant, a large market market participant abuses its position, then it has to be sanctionized in in any way. We have yeah. we have a Wettbewerbsrecht in, in which is which is the same in, in, uh, in, in whole Europe. And uh, I mean, yeah, the authorities should look into that. Okay, so one last statement. From me? Yes, from you, please. <laughs> so, I, I don't know, it, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, think, I think it will, uh, it, my process to fight for for better peering will have an impact uh, on on the global market on the global market and on the global scale um, that that the end users can get actually the, the traffic in the volume they want and uh, yeah that's that's hopefully my contribution to a better internet so thank you very much, um, Freddy. Thank you. Um, thank, you. Uh, thank you for taking your time to answer the questions. Um, one um, information I got from Patrick is that during the break, um, we will have a video chat open and you can ask your questions and we will also ask all speakers of this slot um, to take part on it. And um, 
that's for now. I think we are now into the break. I, I just need to say I need two minutes and I'm in, in uh, I have to get more water and uh, coffee and then I'm there for the, for the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.